Marissa Norcross. And I'm Dave Freund, and this is The Next Page. Marissa, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm terrific. You know, it, it seems like we just did this. Oh, we, wait, we, oh, did we did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so we did one late, later than normal, and now mm-hmm. we're doing one a little bit earlier than normal. Yes. But this is the way you keep consistency and you mm-hmm. release a podcast every week. Mm-hmm. So our podcast listeners know that I, um, I have problems with rabbit holes. Like I go down in rabbit holes really far. Yeah. And today is clearly one of those. I don't know mm-hmm. if we want to call it like the tagline or the subtitle, a snarky memos, the snarky memos of Apollo's unsung genius. So we're going to talk about Tyndall Grams today. I, so I was unfamiliar I, with Tyndall Grams until you uh, explained them to me. Right. Until and you I'm opened my eyes. You what you thought <laughs> about my title. Because it, unless, so, so I'm listening to a book called One Giant Leap. And it's about the Apollo program. And, and it's not a, a historical, chronological, let's start with Kennedy. It does start with Kennedy, but it talks a lot more about what was going on in the world. It talks a lot about um, the amazing magnitude of the Apollo project. Um, you know, that every single state had a subcontractor company working on, on something for the Apollo program. And, it hi- and, I, and I came across this, I heard this statement referring to a person, the center of activity, but never the center of attention. And this, to me, because I was thinking about the podcast about an hour ago, and this, so what I've picked up from this book is really another one of those indicators of, call it the law of attraction, call it, um, you know, my, my, the, the Bider meinhof phenomenon. It's when you're thinking about something, when something is, has raised an, uh, an awareness in your preconscious thought, all of a sudden you find resources everywhere. You find ideas, you find teachings everywhere. And so that's kind of what I've been living through with this book. So I'm listening to a book about the Apollo program because I'm, I was intrigued by it. I lived through it, right? Um, but I find these amazing leadership examples and I find leadership examples in really unusual places. So um, Howard Wilson Tyndall, otherwise known at NASA as Bill Tyndall, was a graduate of Brown. He had a Bachelor's of Science from Brown University. And he's, been, he's given this task to go to MIT because MIT was designing the software. They were writing the software for the Apollo program, which, folks, you really need to just do a Google search on what were the computers like on the Apollo program for the Apollo program on, you know, the, the, the capsules and things. Um, the software wasn't written in code. It was written in code, but it was hard wired programs, literally copper wire. So you really need to Google wound by (laughs) wound by, I know this is going to sound sexist, but little old ladies sitting down that were really good with like needlework. They literally would wind the copper wire in zeros and ones for the programs. Okay. So, but anyways, they're writing this, and and it's very limited in its capacity because back then we didn't have the computing capacity we do now. So Bill goes to MIT, and his job is to um, get them back on track because they just kept falling farther and farther and farther behind, and it became the pacing item for the Apollo project. So after he does such a good job with with MIT, after that, he gets pulled back inside at NASA. And his job is literally to sit in meetings. Um, it, it, let me, I'm just going to read it. Um, in this role, Bill chaired meetings between astronauts, mission controllers, design engineers, contractors, and other relevant parties, uh, adjudicating disagreements and overseeing the details of planning mission techniques. So what he did was he, imagine the complexity of this project and imagine all of these extremely brilliant people coming together, all with very strong opinions about how things should be done. And yet he's able to simplify it and he writes these memos that became known as Tyndallgrams 
and they were such entertaining documents that people couldn't wait to read them. So you 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 looked up one and, and read a couple sentences. Do you still have that handy? Yeah, let me find it again. I I googled Tindalgram and just selected images and uh, was paging through them, and there was a, a where did it go? It was hilarious. Let's see. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, it said, uh, I used to think MIT was a little odd when it came to selecting names for the spacecraft computer programs with all that weird preoccupation with the sun. But now I see they were right all the time and the rest of the world is nuts. <laughs> and, right. And, and then, he, it, you know, he goes it, on and he says, good grief, Charlie Brown. <laughs> right. So that was his writing style. Yes. And And he wrote... Because I what and what what I love is you we have access to them. If you just you did you Google Tyndall Grant. Now you got to be willing to look at scanned copies of typewriter written you know typewriter written things. But he wrote fifteen hundred and sixty one single spaced eight and a half by eleven pages. If it was a book, it would be three thousand one hundred and twenty two pages. And yet people couldn't wait to get them. Um. So who so who Ken, did who saw these? Like were these public memos or So these were memos that went out to the appropriate people at NASA. So it okay. would be typically the people in the meetings and then the people that were responsible for executing things that were talked about in those meetings. Mm-hmm. So there would be it wasn't like super widely distributed as I under, as I understand it, mm-hmm. but at least the folks in the meetings would would um, be reading them. And so Ken Mattingly was one of the Apollo astronauts, and, and he wrote this. Um, We've been in this program for how many years, and yet people are asking questions that are almost like, does anyone know where the moon is and how to find it? And here we're supposed to be going there. Mm-hmm. There are so many questions, and every one of them need an answer. Bill started having these meetings. His initial charter, as I understand it, was just to see if you could figure out an order that we could answer these questions in. Because we can't do it all at once. Let's do the most ones, the most important ones first. So we started having these meetings that kind of put sanity and sense to it. It created this thing we call Tyndallgrams. And then what I, what I underlined here was because Bill Tyndall would listen. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is leadership personified. But not, we're not seeing, this isn't the guy, this isn't the head of NASA. This isn't the guy that is running the programs. This is a guy that's, that's asked to go sit in on the meetings. He doesn't have position or a, a position of power. He's there to listen. And he helps people think better thoughts. Mm-hmm. And he helps, peop- he helps put some, some sense around what's going on. And if we think about last week, what we talked about last week, Bill was a catalyst for NASA. And his, his skills were so important that um, Gene Krantz, who was um, flight director for the Apollo programs, um, said if there should have been a, a lunar plaque left on the moon for somebody from somebody in mission control or flight control, it should have been for Bill Tyndall. Tyndall was the guy who put all the pieces together, and all we did was execute them. So if the mission commander says, or flight director, excuse me, not mission, flight director says, this was the guy that, put, that brought us together so we could actually get to the moon. He was a leader. Yeah. It, you know, and it seemed like he knew how to talk in a way that people would listen or, or I guess type, exactly. t- type in a way that people right. would listen. And, and there, you know, it's, it takes out some of that, like, jargon i you know i don't know much about nasa jargon but i'm sure that that there is some and it it makes it more uh relatable digestible and i and i think too looking you know look at us now many many years later it helps preserve the history oh absolutely right and it makes it digestible for for people like us to understand you know and 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 so so I was starting to think about what what does it take to be a leader like Bill? So we don't, mm-hmm. you know, 
I'm, I'm, I'd love to, and I haven't taken the time to read much of, I just did like you did cursory scans of, of some things, Mm -hmm. but I really want to read a couple of these, um, to see if I can identify his behavior profile Mm -hmm. because clearly he has to have enough high C to organize the thoughts and to organize Mm -hmm. the concepts that were there. But he's got to have enough S and I, the S to know that he needs to relate to pull people together and the I to know how to have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, can you imagine, I cannot imagine writing a memo to PhDs in, you know, aeronautical engineering and say, good grief, Charlie Brown. You know, it's like, you would think that he would have been, you know, scorned and ridiculed. But he mm-hmm. wasn't. Yeah. You've got people like Mattingly, if I'm not mistaken, was it was a test pilot. You know, you've got test pilots and, and former fighter pilots and marine fighter pilots and, and and mathematicians, you know, and physicists saying, oh, when's the next Tyndallgram coming out? Mm-hmm. It's it's like I keep thinking about what would the the modern day Tyndall Graham look like or, or you know what would <laughs> exactly. Tyndall sitting in what is it in a meeting like the note the memo would read like oh yep another meeting that could have been an email <laughs> exactly <laughs> another meeting that could have been an email mm-hmm. let's all let's all meet on zoom right I mean, he yeah. probably would have had so much fun with zoom and webex and mm-hmm. uh and I think that was the key he was so if you think about it, he was having he was keeping humorous yeah Things that were life and death decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when, you know, they, they, they went, if, if you look into what happened, you know, when, when we, and I don't remember which mission it was, but when we lost three astronauts on the launch pad, you know, um, and then you find out that some of these things are just a piece of solder that broke off of a board and just rattled around. So how do you make sure that that never, ever happens again? Those are the kind of things that Bill Tyndall was writing memos about, Mm -hmm. but yet he could do it in a nice way, in a humorous way that drew people in. Um, So I really think I, I was just thinking this morning, how can I work on developing that skill? How can I be, be one of those people that can bring people together to clarify and simplify information. I actually think that you do this very well. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times when we're in meetings and I can tell the meetings are starting to short circuit a bit and we're going all over the place, you just have a way of bringing us back together and saying, well, this is what we agreed on. This is what we said. So maybe we need to do this. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a lot of Bill Tyndall's giftedness. It's something I really want to learn how to do. But I I put some notes together um, for us to talk about you know, how do we become a Bill Tyndall type of leader? And and one of the first things I wrote down here was we listen, we ask questions, and then we respond. And I love how Mattingly said, Bill listened. Mm-hmm. So what do you what are your thoughts about what is it what does it take from ours from a person's standpoint to wanna listen? To want to listen. To hmm. want to listen. I know I'm giving you questions yeah. that I didn't tell you I was going to ask. That's a that's a deep one. Uh, to want to listen. I don't know if it's something. I, I mean, I I would like to think that it's a decision that we're capable of making. Yep. To you know be yeah. be open to listening. Um, right. You know I think. Part of that is acknowledging that you don't have all the answers and that's yes. why, you know, that's why you're in the position to listen. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree. And I think that's what, that was one of the, that's what made Bill's position so great. He didn't have the answers. And he didn't really have an agenda, like he didn't need to have the answers. Right. Right. He all so what was great about Bill was he listened and he knew what kind of questions to ask mm-hmm. because the people that he so I think getting back to what to your your 
your definition of you know how we how do we get to a point where we want to listen first of all it's a choice that we have to make i think and then a realization that we don't have all the answers which is very freeing it is it's so much more freeing to just say mm-hmm. i don't know but you yeah. know what i know that the people in this room have the answer we just haven't discovered it yet yeah but you know this is kind of reminding me of um the things that we've talked about in crucial conversations uh yes. a class that i took years i mean it's been a long time for me and i don't even think i took it with you i think no, i no you didn't right so um i mean correct me if i'm wrong here but you know just thinking about um the opportunities in in meetings or conversations to to say things like what i think i'm hearing is this but I, yes. but perhaps i'm wrong or kind of Correct. like taking um taking some of the like emotionally charged aspects out of of yep. the and this kind of also piggybacks on what we talked about in last week's podcast about uh catalyst about being a, a catalyst and um a catalyst for ideas and how you know you 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 just have to be open to mm-hmm. to the conversation right you know one of the, the whole premise with crucial conversations is that we're trying to increase the information going into what they call the pool of shared meaning mm-hmm. and and I, so I love I love your example there of crucial conversations. I think this is what I'm hearing, and this is why. But I could be wrong. You you speak with 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 tentativeness mm-hmm. that make that then doesn't have the other person on the defensive. Mm-hmm. Or you um, know, using that on on the, on the flip side too, like saying, you know, realizing maybe something is heading south, and, and then thinking like, oh wait, maybe I said that wrong. Maybe that came, maybe the way I described it was not what I actually meant. Yes. Right? Like instead right. of saying, you didn't listen to me <laughs> or or you didn't hear what I said, kind of taking a step back and yep. saying, I think I delivered that incorrectly. It, exactly. I wonder how many people went to Bill after his memos mm-hmm. and said, Bill, I think you, I think you got me wrong here. Yeah. You know, that would be, you know, there's no way for us to ever know that because most of the people unfortunately are long, are no longer with us mm-hmm. um but i'm sure it occurred and i'm sure it came up in the next meeting in the next set of tindlegrams that came out but i but i love the point you know he wanted to listen and he what he did was he helped people he asked questions that got people to think on a deeper level mm-hmm. because he could say so why why are we worried about that tell me what you're concerned about if we do X, Y, Z. And then why is it important for us to do this, this, or this? And it got people to, because it's one thing to make a statement. It's another thing to have to explain why that statement is accurate. But I'm sure he did it in a non-threatening way. And Mm -hmm. what I love is that just proves, you know, he didn't have the positional leadership he was a leader because of what he was doing for the team. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I, I touched on the one, you know, asking people why the person feels so strongly about something. I think the other thing is that, that one of the things I'm sure Bill did was he looked for teaching moments. Because mm-hmm. what you can do is if you can cap, if you catch people doing things well and you celebrate it, it just gives people so much courage. Like they're going, oh, that, yeah, that did work. Well, and one of the things, and I, again, I didn't read in detail any of the Tyndallgrams, um, but one of the things I learned some years ago was that if we start our meetings off with negativity, people get defensive. Mm-hmm. If we start our meetings off with positivity, people are open-minded. And I can just imagine Bill going back to, let's say, Houston after spending weeks and weeks in Massachusetts at MIT and working with them and getting their software program back on track, coming back and saying, let me tell you what they did at MIT. And it's really cool. What could we do here that might be similar? I think, too, so we're looking, you know, teaching moments are when people do things well. The teaching moments clearly are when people are struggling. 
and when people fail so that we can turn them into victories Mm -hmm. and wins. I I think the other thing that, that Bill did was I think, you know, borrowing, borrowing the thought from, from Liz Wiseman from the book multipliers. I think Bill looked for native genius in people. And I think he celebrated it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think he did was this. All the, if you read any of the comments about Tyndall Graham's, people loved them and they loved Bill. And if you think about why do people love somebody else, it's typically because of the way that other person makes them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to add, if you add value to people, you become this, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? People want to be around you. People want to be around you. You attract people to you Mm -hmm. and they're going to be open with you Mm -hmm. because you affirm them. Mm -hmm. So my guess is even though he was very critical of what he needed to be critical of, my guess is he was also very affirming Mm -hmm. or people would have said that Tyndall guy was a jerk. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty cool, this has been a really cool topic for me to dig into. And I want to dig into more actually, um, found some some links and i and i saved them on my ipad because i'm going to be doing some traveling over the next well not immediately but i'll be doing some traveling over the next probably six weeks and i'll have some time to be sitting in a hotel room or in an airport airplane or airport and i'm going to read some of these just to gain more insights on how can i be a better i mean think about this when was the last time you looked forward to the minutes from a meeting like (laughs) You know, okay. I hate, yeah. I hate writing minutes. I hate reading minutes, you know, mm-hmm. but people couldn't wait for another, you know, um, snarky, lunatic Frank. Let, we'll, of, we'll say Frank. Kind of memo. He was, he was Frank and yeah, uh, snarky would denote that it, you know, that he had maybe said, negative intentions. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, I, he was Frank and efficient. Right. <laughs> you know, and what I think was fun was funny too. And you think about it, frank and efficient, and it still took it still took fifteen hundred and sixty one single space pages mm-hmm. t- typed. But what one of the things I uh, there one one of the groupings they actually referred to as loonies, <laughs> which you think is like crazy. No, they were lunar. Lunar. You know, they were going to the moon. So they mm-hmm. just but he called them loonies. Mm-hmm. Here's another loony from from Bill. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, we actually figured this out. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Now we just do it. So I really want to encourage people. Leaders come in all shapes and sizes Mm -hmm. and with all giftedness. And I just, he would have been a neat, I would have loved to be able to have a conversation with Bill Tyndall. Yeah. You know, I, I, it it? it seems like he would have like the non-traditional approach to, right. To leadership, to probably to life. And, uh, I really like that. Yep, and think about how valuable that would be today Mm -hmm. when we really need to have a different approach Mm -hmm. to leadership. Yeah. It would be so cool. But you know what we do have? We do have his writings. Mm -hmm. We have have interviews with people that worked with him. Um, And I I think that's, you know, there's so many things that we need to learn, still yet learn, from the Apollo Project. Um. That, you know, when it, one of them was when as a nation we put our mind to something, we did the impossible. And so whenever we get the right kind of people together with good leadership, nothing's impossible. Mm -hmm. So what other, what, what could we do for society that would be on the same level as the Apollo project? And if we put our minds and our hearts together, we could do the impossible. Pretty cool stuff. Mm-hmm. So, did you think that we would, you would be? Enjo- I'm assuming you're enjoying talking about Bill Tyndall, but did you ever think you'd be enjoy talking about something about the Apollo program? Uh, you know, it wasn't something I'd ever considered, but I am looking I forward <laughs> to uh, to finding some more of these memos and and getting getting a good laugh out of them uh, because. It's it's totally my style. <laughs> it is. And that's why I said I think you have a lot of the giftedness that Bill Tyndall did. So mm-hmm. next week, and I just thought about this as, as we were talking, I think what I'd like to do is for next week, 
I want to dig deeper into how do we have those crucial conversations about things like, you know, how do we have a conversation like Bill Tyndall would have? Mm-hmm. And there is another example that I, that I just, it just hit me from this book um, that will give us another individual we can kind of look into and see what were the, what made them tick and why were they able to do it? Mm-hmm. So I don't know what we're going to call that yet, but that's what we're going to talk about next. week. Okay. How's that? I'll try to find my binder so I can brush up on my skills. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm Dave Freund. I'm Marissa Norcross. And this was The Next Page. <laughs>